In the 1960s, an anti-war movement emerged that has been effectively... So tonight we are welcoming Sarah C.J. May from Waterbury, Connecticut. Sarah was the recycling coordinator at Yale for 20 years and was made a fellow at Yale's Silliman College in recognition for his contribution to that college's recycling effort. After leaving Yale, he took his experiences north and has been the refuse and recycling coordinator for Waterbury since 2015. CJ is not only a refuse and recycling coordinator, but he is a client as well. He created the Connecticut Diet, eating almost exclusively from Connecticut-grown sources since the mid-1990s, and drives a Prius where he continues to get 45 miles per gallon. Lastly, CJ performs his, as his alter ego, Cyril the Sorcerer. The iconic figure of the wizard adds further power to his presentations at schools and events on recycling, water, energy, and other topics. And if you're interested, you can visit CJ's website at Cyril the Sorcerer for more information. And with that, I welcome CJ, and I am, and I'm sure the rest of the community is excited to learn from you. Well, I, I'm, thank you guys for having me. <laughs> I, uh, I have to admit, I've worked in trash and recycling for a long time, <laughs> but it's only been three years that I've worked in the municipal setting uh, and worked with you guys. So I uh, work with people, concerned citizens, uh, elected officials, uh, city officials, etc. Uh, so getting to know the municipal recycling world as I have for the last few years in Waterbury has been a learning experience. And, and frankly, you guys are educating me by the, the discussions that you're having as well. Uh, every city is at a different state with recycling in Connecticut. Uh, so there's some basic stuff I would just consider. One is recycling is required by the law. The law was passed in 1987, came into effect in 1991. Uh, and so if I take this bottle, drink the water, throw this into the trash, I've just committed a crime. Uh, Legally speaking, the city, the state is not going around and enforcing this too much. If the city of Waterbury or the city of New London did not have a recycling program, it would be in violation of the law. If I, as an individual, choose not to participate and throw into the wrong bin, the state is not going to find me. But it's something that cities can, and some cities do, violating uh, if somebody's violating the recycling. Um, so <laughs> the law is one aspect of it. The other one is uh, protecting the environment. Other one is trying to save money. Given that it's recycling is required by law, what does it mean for the city of Waterbury? And as I tried to, to sell our new recycling program to the city of Waterbury, I really tried to talk to people also about the uh, cost benefit issues. Um, and I mean, but, but the problem is, um, you said I'm a magician, so one of the, 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 the goofy <laughs> things is that people don't think that recyclers are magicians. People, unfortunately, think that um, the trash man is a magician. I mean, think about it. When I was growing up, you put your trash out, your cans, your bottles, whatever it might be, and the best thing you're going to do is you're going to take it, you're going to put it into a bag, and then the garbage man, the city employee that you were just talking about, he's going to make it go away. You guys don't believe it, so I'm going to bring it back, right? I didn't get any of you with that one, did I? <laughs> See, I just made the bottle come back. You see, that's the point. That's the point is, if I turn it upside down, and I say that it's gone away, if you guys just look into the bottle, you realize that the bottle hasn't really gone away. And that's the municipal solid waste truth. That if you put your trash out and you say, oh, I don't have to care about it anymore. It's just going to disappear, and I'm never going to have to worry about garbage again. Well, if somebody tells that to you, that's a trick, okay? So it's not a trick. It's a line item on your budget. I don't know what your line item is. For the city of Waterbury, we have 110,000 residents. We pick up trash and recycling from about 32,000 households. Our trash budget is approximately, I don't know, I would say about $2.5 million a year. That's a lot of money. Um, it, we were paying $63, $64 a ton to get rid of it. Our trash would go out of town from Waterbury, maybe about 15 minutes away to Bristol, where they would burn. Waste to energy. Connecticut went on waste to energy big time in the 1980s, partly to solve our garbage problem, and partly because we'd just come out of the energy crisis. Remember the energy crisis? Everybody was concerned. Jimmy Carter was president. So he said, hey, listen, we can get rid of trash, and we can also generate electricity at the same time. That, that was the idea. So unlike most states throughout the entire country, Connecticut burns almost all of its garbage. That's, it's very unique and very, and there's pros and cons to that. Big pros, big cons. Uh, big pro is that you take the trash and you're reducing it by about 80% in volume. 
you have ash left over and you've got to get rid of that ash. It's got to go somewhere. But you've reduced the volume immensely. And that provided uh, for, for elected officials, mayors at that time, a way to say, ah, we don't have to build new landfills. Do you want a landfill near your house? Do you want a landfill near your house? No, nobody wants it. And no mayor wants to be able to have that on a council table. So they said, listen, if we burn our garbage, we can make the ash go away and the ash can go out of state and we'll, we'll solve our problem. And so it was, a, it was a good way to address it at that time. Uh, so we're burning our garbage, but that costs. So we were paying about 63, 64 bucks a ton. Now we're paying $80 a ton. Some of those trash to energy plants are retiring. Wallingford, closed. It's gone. They, they don't do it. Hartford is being reconsidered. So what I'm hearing from a lot of my guys in the waste field is that we better watch out because in a couple of years, we are not going to have a recycling problem. We're going to have a garbage problem. We're not going to, we're going to start paying to send our trash to Pennsylvania, to Ohio. I mean, I don't know. And I'm not sure what you're hearing. You may be hearing a different story, Mr. Mayor, but some of my folks are saying, watch out. We're going to have an issue. And we even have just a trucking issue. There are not enough truck drivers. We have high employment these days, which is great. But they're having a hard time getting enough truck drivers to drive trash trucks. So with closure of some trash plants, they increase from 64 to 80 bucks a ton. Uh, we may start having issues, a greater cost of disposal of garbage. So this is new for you, $80 a ton. Is yeah, oh yeah, it's, right? it's new, it's new. I mean, uh, now just some history. When I was living in this, I live in New Haven, live in New Haven. I work for Waterbury. New Haven and Yale used to pay $17 a ton like in 1988. $17 a ton. <laughs> 17 It was not even a line item on Yale University's budget sheet. It was pocket change. $17 a ton. And then it went up to $50 a ton. People started to pay some detention. Then it went to $98 a ton, and everybody's running around like a chicken with their head cut off. Oh my gosh, $98 a ton. Well, it's come back down from that. But... I think it's important for you guys to be having this discussion. I think it's great that you're having this discussion because you're looking at recycling, but I'm also just giving you a little bit of crystal ball warning that we may have more trash problems, which will make recycling even more interesting to any municipality in a couple of years. From now. Uh, so that's one big issue. So right now, Waterbury is paying 80 bucks. We used to pay 65. We used to be paid $4.25 for single stream recycling. That's mixed recyclables, no trash, single stream recyclables. And now we are having to pay $55. So we went from positive $4.25 a ton to $55 a ton. Ouch. And that's At, over the summer, is that correct? That was over the summer. And basically it's because of the big change that we're seeing with China. And this is not due to the potential trade war with tariffs and stuff between President Trump and the Chinese administration. This is completely separate. It's in part due to the big change to this single stream recycling. America really got moved on to single stream cycling for several, several reasons. One was to make it easy for all of us. You don't have to worry about which bin the things go, you put it all on one bit. That's a great idea. But it was really driven by the private carters and private haulers who were tired of having trucks with separate sections or running two separate trucks for cans and bottles and papers. They hated that. They said, listen, put all this stuff together and then we'll sort it out. And they kind of pushed that a little faster than it was ready. We can separate out glass, metal, plastic, but not really well. Not the metal and the plastic we can separate out, but there's a paper and the glass, there's glass and the paper. It's kind of a mess. And when we told everybody, hey, everybody just put it all in one bin, people are putting literally everything in one bin. I mean, hoses, garden furniture, toys, uh, porcelain, you know, jars. They're putting it all in there and saying, oh, they'll sort it out. And the contamination level is so high that China basically said, no, we've warned you year after year, stop sending us garbage mixed in with your recyclables. And America just said, suck it up, eat it. And now China basically said, we're done. We're done. Now, you guys in your recyclables probably weren't going to China. My recyclables probably weren't going to China. Only about one third of America's recyclables were going from China. And most of that was from the West Coast. Think about it. It's just easier. You put you, from Colorado or California, you put it on a ship, you send it to China, that's great. But the two thirds that wasn't going to China still is now impacted because if Los Angeles can't get rid of its recyclables to China, it's going to start selling them somewhere. So now we have a really overflowing market with places that want to get rid of their stuff and it's crappy. And so, so now we have a big issue. Uh, please, and jump in with questions if you... Your tipping yeah. fees that you cited, sure. when did they go into effect? July 1st for Waterbury's because of contract change. And the uh, AU is your solid waste, the 55 is your recycling. Right. 
Right. It used to be positive 425 recycling, you thought negative 64 for trash. And now where you're at, negative 55 recycling and negative 80 for trash. Were, were your contracts up or did they renegotiate? The them? contracts were up, yeah. And, and uh, so, so it was a tough call to try to, to think about what we were going to do. But now the problem is the contracts were already in the works when the hammer started coming down from China. So we were got the, the, the ship had already sailed. Sure. And so contract terms or how long? One I year with one year with a very good question. One year with a possible renewal. So one of the big things, and I'm going to be asking you guys, is what's what's your my, my boss wants to know literally because we're trying to figure out what's going on in different parts of the state. Which one? What's trash? What's recycling for you these days? It's a five-year term for us currently. For for recycling. recycling is where we're, maybe the mayor. Do you want to comment on that, or do you want me to do it? Oh, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, the uh, um, the recycling is up now, yeah. or next next fall. So we're renegotiating that currently. We don't know the, what yeah. the rate's going to be. Um, our MSW, it's a tenure contract, but I don't know exactly where we are in it. Um, Good. But we're, we actually pay, <laughs> Good. Yeah, well, we pay $58 a ton each December. It okay. gets, uh, we get our new tipping fee, and that goes into effect July 1st of each year. How far can they ratchet it up or down? That, um, I can't give you a we're specific not, answer. No, um, yeah, because no, that, that, they may start rationing it. Yeah, I don't anticipate yeah. it going up Good. very much. Excellent. I'll go out on a limb and say it's probably not going to go up very much. Where does it go? Does it get burned in Preston? Or? It goes up to Preston through Covanta. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. We're Covanta with L. Covanta, right, right. Covanta is the big boy, and so that we have a contract with Covanta, and it's the facility in Bristol that they... Do you participate in a cooperative like we do? No, we don't. We don't. So, so we participate in SCARA. Oh, good, good. Which is, yeah. a, which is a number of municipalities. Anybody know how many? So, so SCARA and municipalities, yes. and that helps to control the rate? No. Great. Yeah. So that, I mean, that, that, that's actually a good thing for me to go back to to my head of public works and, and the mayor because we have to, should we consider something like this as a way to sort of maximize our potential? Yeah, so that's all online. Scarra okay. has a website. Yeah, I, well, I know Winston Averill, who, who's, uh, I believe, is still the Scarra uh, recycling guy, and I've known him for years. He's got a lot of experience, so he's also a really good person. I, I can send you the information. But, yeah, sure. Yeah, we'll, but keep going. Yeah. So no, I'm just going over this because because I just wanted to set the base of where, where we're at, and sure. just so that we can start going back and forth. But you're now start looking at some bigger issues about what changes might you want to make in terms of recycling collection, right? Sure. Yeah. And what do you want to? How do you want to pick so, it up? Yes, and sir. And how to cut down on the volume of like can we keep waste. it up here. Yeah. Can we keep it up here and then we'll yeah. get back to after each other? We have so okay. yeah, yeah, increasing recycling and cutting down on the trash. And the interesting thing is. Waterbury's got a unique issue, and I don't know whether it is with you, but one of our unique issues in Waterbury is that our trash carts are about 15 years old, and one of the things I'm looking to do is actually get lids on them. Are they 40 gallon? No, they're 65, and we went to 65, and 95, sorry, 95 gallon trash. And simply speaking, our trash <laughs> cottage skyrockets on rainy days. On a rainy day, because we get more water in the trash carts, or if it's been a rainy week, because many carts don't have lids, and so we're paying to haul water. So what I'm saying is, you implemented this in fall of 2017 with the cards. Mm -hmm. okay. For recycling, yeah. One of the goals or objectives we have is for us to educate our residents as far as how sure. did you achieve that? Or how, could you tell us how? Okay, educate. I educate. There was that great bit of wisdom I got when I started recycling 30 years ago that said there were three key components to a good recycling program. First is education. The second is education, and the third is education. Uh, I mean, you need good trucks, you need good carts, you need to have that, but the education, you also need to educate the workers on the trucks. You need to educate the citizens. We need to educate all of our elected officials. We need to be all on the same page here. Otherwise, if I give you a cart, it's dead. And I have to admit, my job is in place in large part because of education. The deal that was struck between the city of Waterbury and a group called Closed Loop which uh, I hope you'll get, could contact them. We've talked about this and, a little, a little yeah. bit. But and, I was they provide a zero interest loan so that we could buy three new recycling trucks, or was it two, and 32,000 recycling carts. Was that, okay, we're going to give you a zero interest loan to buy this new technology and all the new toys, but you need to have a full-time staffer there doing education, otherwise it's no good. Okay, and a follow-up to that, besides education, so, not being familiar with Waterbury, yeah. what's your mix of demographics? Households versus rental properties. A lot of rental properties. Huge amount of rental properties. Uh, a lot of two and three and four family homes that the city picks up. There's also a lot of apartments and uh, other services that we don't service. So we service up to 10 units. 
So if you're an apartment complex, we don't take care of you. Yeah. We now have six out of the seven trucks are what we might call one-armed bandit. And then uh, one, at, uh, one every day is a rear load truck with uh, one driver who generally doesn't get out and one or two guys in the back who do jump off. If, we could, if I could snap my fingers, I might change it to have five and two because we have some neighborhoods where on-street parking is so challenging the drivers get frustrated because it's a one, I'm driving my truck, I'm supposed to sit in my cab, the arm is supposed to go down, grab the car and pick it up, but there's cars parked together, there's parking near there, there's, it, it, it's really hard, so then the driver has to get out and go over and do that and pull the thing around. So it's, it is challenging to have the one arm bandit trucks in a dense urban center. Yeah, that, that's that 80% of your fleet is that type of vehicle reason to believe that you have the streets that you can use them. Oh, we have a lot of streets. Waterbury is very diverse. We had three here, yeah. we found we could only really use one. It's, yeah, it, re it, it really depends upon the mix. Uh, and so we have some small lot, what I would call suburbs. It's your city, but we are a suburb. So they're a small lot household, and they generally don't have a problem with on street parking. If you put your cart out, Next to, I got some more toys for it. Uh, no. um, if you put your cart out on the street, generally we can pick it up. And then there's some very sparse, you know, one acre lot suburbs where, where the one armed bandit trucks are excellent. Um, so you haven't had to resort to any type of parking or having cars moved in order for We people. haven't gotten to that yet, but the issue is not done. We've been doing this program for about a year. We launched the program in October and November. And so now one of the issues we are still running into is that people are doing this, they're putting their carts together, and if they put the cart together like this, guys, the grabber hand cannot grab this cart without knocking over that cart. The carts need to be about two feet apart because the grabber hand is quite large. It's like this. So you pick up all your solid waste and recycle every week. Yes. Yeah. So we have it every week, and we, we pick up on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Wednesday is our special day, either leaves or junk, or if there's a holiday on Monday, we basically just move Monday and Tuesday back to Tuesday, Wednesday. So we don't typically have to go and pick up on a Saturday. How do you handle um, both ways? But that's a Wednesday pickup. So people have to call in and they must schedule. And say, hi, my name is John Smith, I'm at 123 East Main Street, and I've got uh, two couches and a chair. Uh, and then they say, great, okay, you can put it out Tuesday night for pickup on Wednesday. Thank you, click. That's the way it's it. picked up, or is yeah. there a fee associated with No fee associated with curbside pickup. Uh, you have two free drop-offs at our landfill, it's closed landfill, uh, per year. Um, you can go more than that, but then you have to start paying for that. And it's only residential. I can't bring my business in. So if I showed up with 50 windows, no, I'm sorry. If I'm showing up with two because I did a little renovation in my house, that, that's fine. Check, check uh, that you. No, go ahead. So when you started your program, you say you pick up recycling and MSW every week. Did you consider doing recycling every other week? Or did. was that not? We did. Why and did and you actually, go that excellent week? question. And I must, I must admit, uh, uh, the, an the answer which really pushed us over uh, to, to make sure that we stayed with every week. I, I was in favor of every week. Uh, but we spoke to a, a wonderful person, Marilyn Cruz Aponte, who has worked in the Hartford region in New Britain, Public Works, Deputy Director of Public Works. She's a person I respect on every level, as a person and as a person who knows this stuff. And having worked in the city of Hartford, she said, CJ, you know, you might save a few bucks if you switch to every other week, but it will so mess up people's rhythms. Is this the week when I put the recycling out, or was it last week that I put recycling out? If you're starting a new program, and we were starting a new problem, she says, don't risk it. You know, I mean, that would really confuse people. And we want to make it as easy as possible. You put your trash out, you put your recycling out. That's it. And she says, big cities have tougher time in getting all the residents to participate. One of the problems I, I see that we have is um, our ordinances are quite old, first of all. So you're allowed 10, 30-gallon garbage cans per week. That's, wow. Yeah, if you can do that, you're very impressive. <laughs> um, but I'm wondering if you have a limit, are you able to put one of each each week, or is it you have to pay more people to put out more? At, at this your... point, you know, if you want to fit another trash cart, you must buy it for $55. Okay. So this is $55. So one-time fee, or is it one time fee? If it gets stolen or broken, you have to, it's your responsibility so to fix it. One sixty, they're both sixty. Sorry, ninety-five gallons. My, on my bed, ninety-five. We have sixty-five gallon ones available, generally for senior citizens. So some senior citizens who just do not want to deal with ninety-five, they want a smaller car. And so most of my December two thousand seventeen was spent going to one neighborhood where there are a lot of 
senior citizens and giving them a 65 gallon car. Are both your recycle and solid waste at the same size? Yes, it may be, you can request the smaller oh, version if you wish to, right. Um, and so, and again, so the, if you want more trash carts, you have to pay for it. If you want another recycling cart and we determine you're really using it right, you can have another recycling cart. Like, I've got 10 kids. Fine, here's another recycling cart. You know, uh, that's it. If we find, come back next week and we find that you're filling your, tra your recycling cart with trash, we will give you a big sticker. And I've got some samples up here to hand over to you guys. We'll slap it on there. It's in English and Spanish. It's very clear. What is it? And if we come back and you haven't cleaned up after a week, boom, we yank the cart. We pull it, you're, you're done, you know. You can come back and say, please, please, I'm sorry, it was my neighbor. Okay, we'll give you another try. Um, we haven't found anybody yet. Our plan, we don't want to <coughs> make people angry. And we're very happy. The city of Waterbury has really embraced the program. They've been very positive about it. They like, like the carts. It's very good. We don't want to start administering fines and really taking people off because then we get adversaries. So when you say the city of Waterbury, do you mean the residents or the actual administration? I would say both. I mean, I've been I've been very lucky uh, that that the way we really approached this was positive, 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 positive. And I have not gone. We have not started going and saying, "Hey, we found recyclables in your trash. We're going to fine you fifty bucks for not recycling." We may do that at some point. That's not our plan right now. Right now, we want to make sure is, hey, we found some trash in your recyclables. Please don't put styrofoam in there. Please so don't put food. If I understand your current system, if they put something in one of the bins that they shouldn't, they get a little notice as far as... We're only looking at the recyclables saying, right now. Right. But if they were to put something in, like, the styrofoam or something, your pickup guys determined don't belong, how do you handle that? It depends on the guy. Officially speaking, they're supposed to do it. But because they're using the one-armed bandit truck, if I pull up to your house here, I'm grabbing this cart and I'm tipping it in before I can see anything. And there's a camera. So if I'm going like this and I see it, the driver is supposed to say, hey, please, no garden hoses. They're supposed to stop, get a sticker, and put that sticker right on their cart and leave it for you. I'm talking Most of the drivers don't bother to get out and yeah. put the sticker I'm not on. I'm saying so much so that it's outside the bins yeah. that it's left on the curb. Mm -hmm. In addition to what, assuming that they probably would just leave that. If I was to pull up his house and, and I was to see a bunch of stuff on the side, does it fall into your Wednesday pickup routine, or does it just? Get well, it depends what it is. It was a garden hose. No, if it was two couches. They might call it, and they might just leave it, and then until he calls up and says, hey, how come you didn't pick up our couches? And we would say, because you didn't tell us to pick up your couches. I mean, we've, just so, that, we've had yeah. everything from toilets to engine blocks that these guys, that oh, yeah. our guys have had to put up with. Yeah. Oh, and, and I, they, I don't know they, about they, legal they, tire dumping. They, they have a legal they, tire they, dumping. They abide by, by what they're not supposed to do and not pick it up, and then the resident complains to the city hall, and they're sent back out to pick the item up anyway. So, CJ, yours are green for recycling. It's unfortunately back. The city of Waterbury uses yeah, blue for trash. So this this is confusing. So, the, the, basically, the national recycling color, not official, but recyclers around the country are advocating for blue is recycling um, because it's sort of a standard spin, the blue bit. We always just said the blue bit. Unfortunately, Waterbury is backwards. Waterbury chose blue for trash 15 years ago, and we're stuck with it. They were using an orange bin. For curbside, in the orange bin, that was the old, that was the bin that we were using when I started with the program three years ago. I would say 10% of the household had it, and hardly anybody used it. Now all of the households have it, and our study says about two thirds of the households are participating, which is pretty good. Uh, and the way we determine that is not every week. Uh, a, a set out rate is how many houses on your street put it out this week. But the real number should be how many houses put it out at least once a month. Because you might not put it out this month. And, and if you have a small family, you might not need to, to you have put a card out every week. So, so, so we, we basically determined we had a driver mark down your house yes or no this week. Your house yes or no this week. Do it for four weeks in a row. And so we came back with the number, roughly 65% participation. Wow. So you, you switched, uh, let's just say it was last November-ish, and you got the cards. Mm -hmm. And did that reduce your solid waste a great deal, or do you have statistics? Slightly. And the number, did I send you the full chart? I have the chart yeah. with, with the amount of recycling use. It has the recyclables in it, but it doesn't our, have the reduction on the other our side. Our trash has gone down modestly. Was modestly. that, were you expecting it to go down more or less? Yeah, we wanted it, we wanted it to go more, because, it, because I mean, the mayor wants to do this for many reasons, but certainly that other one is because we wanted to cut our trash bill. And so we've seen some reduction in some months for the trash and some not. And I keep going back and saying, Rain, 
let's get it rid of rid of rain because that, that's another issue. Um, so I, I think I talked to you on the phone about this. One of the little experiments I did, um, a local newspaper, a regional newspaper is called the day. And yeah. if, if you weigh them, it's 80% more when it's wet. So we use the your red bins, yeah. a lot of us do, and it's a concern. I like the lid on everything, but you know we have bins. And if we don't get the water out, as Marty said, you're moving water around. And then in the winter, it snows, the ice it melts, it's ice. You're, you're, you're literally paying to move water around. So maybe you could talk about, I think you did a study as well. Oh, well, I that was all the details, but... Yeah, well, the, 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 the basic, this was put out by one of our employees, Mark Urbanski, who's one of the foremen. He knows more about all this stuff than I do, but he's boots on the ground. But he, you, you're pointing out, he says, gosh, a lot of the water break carts are so old, they have no lids, the trash carts. And so they're broken off. The cart's fine, but the, 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 the lid is gone. And he said, yeah, and you know, we're getting rain. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, all the rain goes into the cart. And I'm like, oh, yeah. So I did a little math. And I found out we, we get about 52 inches of rain a year in Connecticut. Okay. I went to a friend of mine who's got a PhD in water science from, WP, from uh, MIT. And I said, well, how much should I count? He says, discount 50% of that due to evaporation. So I said, okay, let's call it 26 inches of rain. Now, if my cart doesn't have any holes in it, how much rain would accumulate and be picked up every week? And so I measured out the size of the cart, 26 inches of rain, how much does water rain, blah, blah, blah. I realized that with our $64 a ton tipping fee two years ago, even with 26 inches of rain, it was costing us $20 a year in water. And I said, if our lids only cost $20 as a replacement, we paid them off in one year. And after that, we're producing more of our trash. So this is something we're trying to work on, and we're trying to get a line item on the budget to start replacing lids. But it, it's, that's, that's not our direct goal. Our direct goal is recycling, but it was one of our wonderful foremen who just observed, we are hauling water. And sure enough, we had a lot of rain last week. Bam! Did our trash budget. We are, you know, we're paying to haul water. Um, so, and the, the guys at the, the burn plants don't like water either. They're burning that stuff. They love the dry paper. They do not like water. Do you do any, uh, any with food diversion or any of that type of thing in Waterbury yet? Not yet. So we're but I, but yeah, no, <laughs> food, I'm, I'm glad that you're doing that. The rough statistic is that about one third of all the stuff we call trash is either food or leaves or grass, organics, materials that could go back to a compost pile, whether in your backyard or uh, to collect it and have it go to a professional composter. And uh, there was a zero waste school movement going on in Connecticut, mostly pushed by Newtown. I went to their school program, they were amazing. They, in their cafeterias, have a trash bin, a recycling bin, a food waste bin, and a milk bin, just so you pour the milk out. You get all that wet, sticky, heavy organics out of your trash. Wow, that's great. But food waste composting is a lot more challenging than recycling is. Recycling is relatively dry. If I miss picking your recyclables up this week, ah, it's not great, but it's okay. If I don't pick up your food waste this week, you're not going to be happy at all. And it smells, and there's, there's, it's a big challenge. It's a great pilot project, and I like you guys are doing it. I mean, it's, it's uh, something I want Waterbury to do. Thank you. Just for the people out here, so what CD is referring to is we have a program with our, with our schools. Five of the seven, um, a pig farmer from Waterford comes and picks up the food scraps. And in the first year, it's happened, I believe it was last September it started, we diverted 67.6 tons of food scraps from our schools, which then is out of our MSW, so we're not shipping 67 and a half tons um, up to Coventa or Preston to burn. Um, so. I just to yeah, no, no, I think that's important. I mean, it's all related. We're talking about recycling tonight, but it is related. Sure. Um, and so, uh, I, to get back to the original question, you're saying, how are we cutting down trash? Our goal is to try to keep getting more and more people participating in the program. When I went back to the closed loop fund people and said, hey, listen, our participation rate is about 65%, they said, hey, in the first year, that's pretty good. We'd like to see you at something around 75% or 85% participation. And so we really want to do that. We also need to go to our schools. I was just trying to talk to our drivers. Uh, today, we also pick up our school trash and our school recycling. And one of the drivers said, when I go to the schools, I see we got some cardboard getting recycled, but we're still seeing cardboard, more cardboard than we want in our trash dumpsters. That means we're paying to get rid of that. And there's also a lot of milk. When they pack that trash truck, squishy milk comes out. Milk is heavy. So it's great that you're looking at that, and if all of our schools could start doing that, we're not only going to be reducing our trash load, 
but we're going to be teaching kids a valuable lesson. I want to get to John. So I have one more quick question. So um, before you started your program, if you go a month before, did everybody have bins or recycling carts or what? What was like, one of the things we struggle with in New London? We don't have uh, the whole citizenry doesn't have something to put the recycling right. And sometimes you drive around, as I told someone earlier, six months ago I never would have noticed. But you drive around and you see people trying to recycle. So they'll they'll have their garbage can and next to it will be a pile of cardboard yeah. or next to it will be newspapers. Right. And so we don't have the receptacles to make that happen in New London. Right. So where did you come from before you got the closing? Good, from good, good question. I, mean, I think they, carts. they were using basically this 18 gallon style bin since 1990. Um, and so when I moved into the, where I started working for the city of Waterbury, I would say again, about 10% of the households had one. 90% didn't have one. They lost it or they didn't bother, it got stolen. People use it for their rocks in their backyard or for their beer, for a party. I mean, it, it just, it gets, it's, it's gone. Uh, I had one person even say to me, I didn't even know Waterbury had a recycling program because the truck never came down the street and nobody on the street used one of the bins. So for the first two years I was there, I pushed really hard to go down to community events and saying, here, do you want a bin? Give me your address, we'll deliver you a bin. Oh, okay, I'll take a bin. So we got more people to try to participate on that small scale level. And then I would say, here, we'll give you a bin for now, but in a year or two, we're gonna be switching over to a big cart. And most of the people would say, oh, that's great. We, we, we're looking forward to it. So when the delivery happened for this carts, every household got one, everybody got one. You know, and uh, it's it's. I think that made it important because a lot of people wouldn't have made the effort to request it. They're not green freak recyclers who go around hugging trees. But if you give them a cart, they'll do it. So, how did you? Um, so our audience here were what I'll call regulars. A lot of us have lived here for a while. So how do you communicate with the people who come and go in Waterbury? That is the biggest challenge. Okay, the the biggest sector of challenge for any recycling community is generally low-income, multi-family, frequent move households. So you describe them a little bit. Yeah, it's the most challenge because they move in and they may not feel invested in that community. It's not their community. I'm, I'm here for six months and then I'm gonna be moving someplace else. You know, and also they get frustrated. Well, it's not really mine, you know? Uh, I'm renting this place. I don't feel like this is my home necessarily. Uh, and so we have, those are the biggest challenge areas in Waterbury. And on Wednesday, we're gonna be going out in the areas where we're gonna be tagging carts that have been trashed are generally low income, multifamily, frequent moving households. So have you found anything that's been semi or very successful? Tag, yet? look. Uh, there's a lot of webinars available. So anybody, if you can get on some mailing lists, the Recycling Partnership, et cetera, has webinars of people who've gotten successful programs from around the country. And so I'm sitting there in my office listening to these webinars. And they say, communication back to people is really important. And one of the best ways to communicate it is a tag and a not pickup for most people. Because if I put out my recycling cart, you know, blah, blah, and then I come home and it hasn't been emptied, I'm like, what the hey? How come you didn't have to a recycling cart? And I'm going to read this sticker, and I'm going to say, what? Oh, okay. I, I'll fix it. I didn't know I couldn't do styrofoam. That's generally, though, for somebody who may own their house, their long-term resident. In, if, if, if it's a three-family house, and Waterbury has many three-family houses, they may come home and they just say, this is just another this. This is just another trash cart. I don't care that it's very clearly labeled for recycling. We have recycling symbols on the side. We put stickers on the top. There's multi-language and pictures on the top explaining how it's used. They may not care. They may, they just may not care. And so that's where we take the cart away. If we've done everything we can to educate people and they don't do participate, we take the cart away. Um, and what do you do to Well, everything I can possible. Uh, when, when, the, the big thing, here's, my, my single thing is, is the cart is the most important educational piece in the puzzle. This cart is the thing that's everywhere. And if it's bad, it's bad. If it's good, it's good. And so one of the things I was very happy to fight for, and I know you have, Mr. Mayor, you guys all have pride. In most cities, regardless of whether it's a trash cart or a recycling cart, just put the city seal on the side. I don't know which it is. I look at that cart, I don't know which it is. Maybe it says in small print, recycling or trash in the top. But from this distance, I don't know what it is. So I said, please, 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 I want a big honking recycling symbol on the side, as big as possible. And so 
the public works chief and the mayor said, okay. So that way, if it's 50 feet away, I know that's the recycling cart. They also did something I didn't want to do, but I am so happy they did. They said, we don't want just a green recycling cart. Somebody must be a Green Bay Packers fan because we want a green recycling cart with a yellow lid. And I said, that's really kind of, ugh. But the great thing about that is that the in the- is, the one that's colors. Yeah. Well, good, good, because- <laughs> 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 I'm going to keep going. Uh, so the point is that if you have a dark blue cart and a dark green cart, in the semi-darkness of dawn or in the evening, you can't tell them apart. The recycling symbol on the side would help, but not a lot. But if it has a bright yellow lid, even in the dusk or the dawn, you can look at it and say, that's the recycling cart, that's the trash cart. That's huge. It really is huge. Now, we also have on the top of this cart, English and Spanish pictures that, yes, blah, 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 pictures, cans, bottles, etc. paper, paper, no, and then we have that, see, no, and we have all of that stuff there, plus our contact information, so that it can be right there for the person to understand. We sent out magnets uh, that go out to people here. This has got a refrigerator magnet. I love refrigerator magnets because if you get this, and not everybody open these up, people might read this. Spanish, English, and then it goes in the trash, it goes in the ground. But if I give you something useful, a refrigerator magnet, so you can put up your grandchild's pictures, you might stick it in your fridge and it might stay there forever. And that's what I want, is I want it to stay there forever on your fridge. So it's got the information, but also the phone number. Hey, listen, what do I do? So if you have a question, how do I get my couch picked up? You call that number. So I think refrigerator magnets are, are really important because they, they stick with people. Um, Eighty percent of the being reserved for that one on bandits. Yeah. Did that come about as of 2017? Yes. Different trucks before. Yeah. Before, before other, these, these were all being picked up. The one on bandits were for trash, but recycling was picked up by the old school truck with a guy getting down, grabbing the bin, dumping it inside. The same truck that they used to dump paper in one and cans and bottles in the two compartments. Do you do you lease or own your fleet? Own it. So own it. And, and, our, and our workers were all public works employees union. And yours, some of those five or four were purchased through the close. I think it's, it was two or three. I got to go two or three. Okay. Two or three. Yeah, not not the entire bit, but it, yeah. Go ahead. I just want to re remember something you told me at one point about um, you performed a, an audit of uh, the performance of uh, the municipal pickup team. I think before mm -hmm. closed loop even started, and yeah. there was. Um, they have uh, a day schedule. They don't work hourly. They they're on what's called the incentive program, yeah. and in this was a contract that was set up with the, that union beforehand. So they start, I think, officially at four o'clock in the morning. If they complete their route, they're considered to have completed their hours, and then they may leave. Um, and so there's pros and cons to that. And I'll speak as myself, not the city of Waterbury. Um, I think there's a real problem with that. The problem is they hurry, and probably with the biggest complaints I get are from citizens saying, they leave the carts higgledy-piggledy. Well, they're leaving the carts higgledy-piggledy. If they were leaving the carts higgledy-piggledy and working the full seven hours, then there's, a, that's, oh, I can kind of understand. But if they're leaving the carts higgledy-piggledy and they're leaving a couple hours early, to my mind that means they're hurrying when they should be taking their time. and. That, that's an issue. We have a similar program, yet it hasn't been a lot. It's not doable now because of staffing situations and fleet. But one of the issues we had with that, not so much the Higgly Piggly, it's because of the rush. I don't know if you found it, whatever stuff was literally left on the road that they were in such a rush, they just left it there and didn't bother picking it up. If it missed the truck. We haven't had so much trash in the road. The biggest concern I've had from Waterbury residents is carts left not at the curb, but at in the street, you know, yeah. several feet away from the curb. And then they get out of the driveway and they're, they're trying to navigate around, uh, or the cart has been moved very quickly towards the curbside and is tumbled over. And then there's some residents who even claim that the reason the lid is broken is because it was of the rough handling of the drivers. Now it could be, drivers are always rough for the carts, and if the lid is old, the lid could break. But I understand the person's concern. Marty, you have a question? Yeah, yeah. How, how does the city itself do with recycling? Our own buildings? Whether it be our buildings or parks or 
common areas? Good areas. So this, the city, we have a recycling program full blast in, in my building, uh, City Hall, and the other main office building across the street. And they do fairly well. I haven't done an audit of every single bin, but I, I've been impressed. The amount of paper that's coming out is quite good. So I'm happy with those. Uh, both Two of those were set up before I got there, and one is when I got there. Other buildings we haven't got into yet because my boss basically said, first goal is curbside recycling, 32,000 residents. Focus on that. As that gets settled, we're going to move over, hopefully in 2019, and really get schools going more fully than they are. Then we want to get to the municipal buildings more fully. Um, parks, we have some recycling bins in the renovated green, matched. The law requires cities to provide parallel recycling in all public venues, whether it's owned by the city or not. So like the streets. So theoretically, every single trash can you have on a street needs to have a recycling bin next to it. Every single trash can you have at a park or in a city building is supposed to have a recycling bin next to it. This can be very expensive. Now the way we got around that at Yale when I was at Yale, well this was my last project before leaving Yale, was Yale wanted to do this, and it wasn't a law for Yale, but it just this was four years ago, and we went and realized that Yale had a gazillion trash cans all over campus, and these are very expensive. Thousand dollar wrought iron trash cans, gorgeous. And we simply pulled half of them, repainted them green, relabeled them, and put them back adjacent to the other remaining trash cans. So now we had, we have the number of trash cans and had the number of locations, but now they were all trash plus recycling locations. And that was the way we got out of that bind. It was a lot of work to do that. Um, but you could consider doing that and say, do we need trash cans everywhere you need them? There's no law that says you have to have a trash can at every corner. You can have no trash cans on any corner. Um, but you could pull some of those trash cans, relabel them, but relabel them, please make sure you relabel them carefully. There's a lot of issues. Uh, trash and recycling should be next to each other. They should be different color. They should have a restrictive lid. If you have a recycling bin with an open hole, it's dead. Forget it. If there's no labeling, you're dead. It needs to have a recycling symbol. It should have an English and Spanish. It needs to be in your face. Because if I have a tiny little thing that says recycling here, and I'm having a good time talking to you and drinking a beer, there's no way I'm going to put it into the right bin. It has to be really in your face that this is a recycling bin. Otherwise, people say, oh, recycling, nobody, nobody ever recycles. But if you don't label it, you're setting yourself up for failure. So in the city of Waterbury, um, do you pick up just residential or do you do businesses as well? No businesses, no. No, no residential. Not at all? No, no. I mean, occasionally there are like a pizza place that has residences above it. And okay. so, in, I don't know if you like a corner store, there's a mom and pop store, sure. and there might be two apartments above it. Officially, we're only picking up the two residents above it, but I could probably can bet that the pizza place might put some of its stuff into our, you know, if they put, if they put it in the right bin, then I don't really care. Sure. Uh, but officially, we're not businesses. No. This has come up in our, a couple of our meetings in the past, and Marty's talked about it. Um, I'm going to draw on your vast knowledge of a thousand years of doing this. <laughs> I don't know about a thousand. Yeah. Uh, was single vast. stream recycling a mistake? Probably was too early. I think in five or ten years we may be doing single stream properly, but we can't separate out the glass and the paper well enough right now. Uh, and so it's a real financial burden. But there's another side to the story. Other people are saying if these recycling centers, and Connecticut basically has five recycling centers, if they invested the right amount of money, which could be a million dollars or so, they could properly separate out that glass and sell it. So some people say, recycling centers, stop whining. Stop saying, no, oh, we can't sell our glass. <laughs> Suck it up. Put the million dollars in. Update your technology. You're using old technology. Get the new technology. Then you can complain if you want. But do that. That's what some people are saying to the recycling centers. Oh, the recycling centers themselves are saying, oh, I still can't sell. So I don't know. I'm much more of an education curbside talk to people guy. I don't know the technology well enough. But it certainly was a little too early, and it certainly, although it's really helped more people recycle, it's a, been a big economic problem uh, on our end. The truckers love it, sure. but, but now we have an issue. So, go ahead, what has the process of working with closed loop been like? I know you were sort of a part of the deal, because yeah. we don't know what it was like to, to get the loan. Right. But, but what well, sounds like they've stayed in touch. They, they have. They, 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 they require that, too. Yeah. So, so the full transparency, remember, I have my job in part because of closed loop. So I, I, I may be 
overly positive towards them, but I've also had a chance to meet with them, and I think the world of them, because they are trying to look nationwide at what are the problem points in creating a full recycling economy, and let's tackle each of those problem points and fix them. Sometimes it's helping a municipality like us or New London fix its curbside collection. Sometimes it's maybe coming up with a better way to clean glass so that we can sell that glass. Some way it's coming up helping some guy who's got a great Bill Gates, uh, Tesla idea for making a new product out of recycling. Okay, we'll help you. Uh, so I love them. Uh, they're really nice people. They have a lot of experience. The one person we've worked with most is a guy named Bob Milligan. I don't know if you've had a chance to talk to him. He's, he just has a world of knowledge in trucks, recycling, tonnage. Uh, he's a great guy to have a cup of coffee with because he knows stuff. And uh, he's been basically holding our hand through this process. I'm required to give them a monthly report for the first year. We're done with that now. I'm doing quarterly reports. But I just went down to New York City where they are talking with Amazon, Starbucks, Coke, Pepsi, Walmart, I mean the big players, because they say the best way to solve recycling is not just to say, okay, we're gonna come up with better technology to deal with whatever you give us. They're having the recycling people who do the sorting talk with the manufacturers like Coke and Pepsi and Walmart and say, hey, can you recycle this? No, well, how about if we made our package that way? Could you recycle that? If you get this whole economy to talk together, instead of just saying, hey, deal with it, you can actually build a better economy. And, uh, and so I'm very pleased that they're really trying to look at the big picture. And, I, and they're nice people. They, 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 they are big idealist ID people who want to work brass tacks on the ground to make it happen. Good. Um, what is, how are they, um, how do they manage the uh, separation of, of paper and how do they do that? It's cool, you, the best way to do it is go watch some YouTube videos. Like, put, re, re, go to Recycling Center, type Recycling Center on YouTube. And all, the truck will come and dump all the cans, the bottles, the papers, and the cardboard on the ground. They look at it to make sure that there's no like lawn chairs. It goes up conveyor belts, and they basically bounce the stuff around. And as they're bouncing it around, generally the paper and the lighter stuff will kind of bounce off, and they can get that to go over here. And the heavy stuff like glass will fall through. That's why they hate plastic bags, because when they're bouncing this around and spinning gears around, if I put a plastic bag in there, that plastic bag gets tied up onto those gears, and then they stop the machinery, and they have to go in there with X-Acto blades and cut those plastic bags off, so they hate plastic bags. So they bounce that, and they separate the heavy from the light. They use magnets to pull out the steel tin cans. Um, aluminum can be blown off by wind, or there's a magnetic process called an eddy current, which can grab aluminum or shoot it off like the force in Star Wars. Uh, the technology is really cool. They can even have some, some of the glass is sorted by green and brown and clear by eyes. The conveyor belt's going on here. You grab green, you grab brown, you grab the clear glass and sort it out. In some places, they're doing it with lasers. They actually shoot a laser at the glass, and the laser bounces back and tells you, oh, that's a clear bot, oh, that's a green bot, you know? So some of it's quite cool. Um, and they can do a lot of separation, but they can't do it 100%, and they haven't been doing it as well as we really need to make single stream successful. But I bet you, give us five more years, I think we may be able to make it happen. You know? so, along with Jackie's question, and you, it was one of my questions you just brought up, about plastic bags. Yeah. And some of the literature I've started to free, everything says no plastic. Have you found success in getting plastic bags out of your recycling, or, or is it as big of a challenge for you as it is for us? I would have to say relatively, yes. I mean, I will still go down some streets, and I will see a plastic bag with materials in, it in a recycling cart. And if I stop, sometimes it's garbage, and this person just doesn't care. Sure. Uh, we put them a tag, but they don't care. But sometimes I'll see perfectly clean recyclables. And the person who's doing this because they're fastidious and they clean out their cans and their bottles, and they put it in a plastic bag and they put it in a, and they're very happy. And we have to put a sign on there saying, no plastic bags, please. And I did that at, at a civic meeting like this and a woman went, oh. It's, it's a, I've been putting all my recyclables in plastic bags. They say, don't worry, you, you didn't kill the process, but just don't do it anymore. And then I'm hoping she goes and tells 10 friends. And I'm very happy to say that we were working with a new company, even though they're charging us $55 for the recyclables. When I asked them, how is our contamination rate? Because cities like yours and cities like ours don't always have the cleanest recyclables. And I was really happy that the recycling center operation manager said, you're actually pretty clean. I said, really? He says, yeah, we're pretty clean. We're, we're not that bad. The one issue we had 
you're going to think the wrong thing first, was hypodermic needles. And it was like, oh, and I was thinking like, like junkies, you know, uh, people using illegal drugs. And they thought, it didn't seem to be that. It actually seemed to be people using them for medicinal purposes who are advised to take all their hypodermic needles and put them into, say, a bleach bottle or a detergent bottle, put them, screw the cap on it, and put it in your trash, not your recycling. But somehow they're thinking, oh, the bottle's recyclable, so I'll put that in the recycling. No, 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 because the, tr the recycling truck compacts that bottle. It's going to break the bottle open, and then hypodermic needle's going to go all over the recycling truck. Um, and so when it gets to the sorting center, there's a mass of cans, bottles, papers, and hypodermic needles. So that's the one thing they're saying to us, please try to get that word back. And I'm actually pleased that that's the biggest issue we're, we're hearing back from our, our uh our sorting centers at the hypodermic needles, uh, and that actually seems to be with good intention. But it's also because our drivers, when they can, don't pick up a nasty household. If they go, come up, if they come up to a household and they see trash, and this is say this is our recycling cart, and there's trash bulging out of the recycling cart, they just won't empty it. They won't empty it. They're supposed to get out and put a tag on it. I wish they would because that would help that education process. Uh, but they won't empty it, and if they don't empty it, then it doesn't go to the center. So what happens when that constituent calls up the mayor's office and says, they didn't pick, up didn't pick it up? They will generally be forwarded to our office, and either I or one of my colleagues will empty it. But the best conversation I had was this. It was, it was, there's a, there's a, a, one of my coworkers, his office is next, so I could hear his phone calls. He says, hi, this is Mike, can I help you? What, they didn't pick up your, your, your trash, ma'am? You say they didn't pick up your trash? Oh, you mean... They didn't pick up your trash in the blue cart, ma'am. And he was asking a leading question. Oh, no, it's in a green cart, ma'am? That's not a trash cart. No, ma'am, that's your recycling bin. Actually, ma'am, it does say recycling on it. It has recycling symbols on the side. Yes, and it has recycling information on the top in English and in Spanish. With pictures, ma'am. Yes, we'll be happy to empty it once you get the trash cleaned out and only put recycling in it. Thank you, ma'am. So, <laughs> she called at least, but she was not paying attention, and she just thought, oh, this is a new trash cart. You know, we're all busy people, but she was too busy to notice that there's a giant recycling symbol on the side. So, with your, um, with your, your, your garbage in, your recycling, you, you want to get lids. And one of the rules, I believe, in Waterford is if it's not closed all the way, they don't pick it up. We haven't. We don't have that policy. I'm just, just asking. You. No, no. I'm just curious where you're headed. No. Or no. In some ways, I like it when the lid is popped open because then we can slightly see what's exactly. going on inside there. I, I like. It. I think it's great. Um, so, out of curiosity, during your journey, yeah. are there any mistakes you could tell us not to make? Maybe. Well, what we were just discussing, I would probably really try to get a good handle on which neighborhoods need a one-armed bandit, and which neighborhoods have so much on-street parking, telephone poles, mailboxes, stuff, that you really need to have a guy get out from the back of the truck and go and empty it. Because uh, it, it's frustrating for the, the, the driver of a one-armed bandit truck, and it's frustrating for the resident. And we also have some cul-de-sacs, really tight cul-de-sacs. And once we get into snow season, you're basically taking a hippopotamus and you're trying to send it down a cul-de-sac and turn around, and it can't do it. I mean, it really, and it's very frustrating. But then we have, we have to make sure that the driver, because the driver's like, oh, it's too tight, I'm not going to go down there. What do you mean you're just not going to go down there? You know, you know, like, the, the resident calls up, I haven't been picked up for two weeks, oh, it's too tight. You, you, no, you have to pick it up. So, so that, that's an issue, is trying to make sure that the driver says, yeah, suck it up. It, it, you still park it at the edge of the cul-de-sac, walk down there, grab the car, empty it. Is it but it's not taking them to overtime. It's part of their I could leave early time, and so therefore I think the Senate problem program is a challenge for us at this point. So you mentioned, uh, I'm just kind of curious, you started at 4 a.m. That's my opinion. Okay, so, no, yeah. Yeah. so you start at 4 a.m. Yeah. Are there complaints that that's too early? Uh, so I haven't heard that directly. Because you must have where you have to put up the garbage the night before versus right. yeah, before sure. 7 a.m. or whatever the yeah. next day. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny, that has not been what people complain about. What do they complain about? They, they complain about the carts being left in the curb or being thrown quickly uh, or they didn't pick it up. Uh, and sometimes they don't pick it up is because it's too tight. Sometimes it's because they didn't see it. Sometimes I'm not sure <laughs> why it is. A little background for us. Before we went yeah. the bins like you have here, the green ones we have with the lids, the issue here was 
people were putting their own Rubbermaid 32 gallons out the old way and lids weren't being put on. Uh, or it was a situation where they didn't want to put a lid on because the drive, the pickup guy decided to play Frisbee and you came home from work and decided, where is my lid for my garbage can? So we went to this with the one just for our solid ways to re re remedy that problem. Yeah. Downside is, like you, we had about two thirds of our neighborhoods probably can't handle the one on bandits. We right. made the mistake of buying three of them, mm -hmm. only to have to unload two of them down the road because we couldn't use them. Yeah. It, 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 getting that number right of how many households could be which way and how much households the other way, that was that's a big issue. I mean, so we, we've had our guys boots on the streets come to a meeting a couple about a month ago, literally tell us that they have neighborhoods where they have exactly what you're talking about, where the cars, the telephone, you know, it's tricky. With your new cards that you just introduced, do you use the RFID radio for Good question. So almost any cart you're going to buy today from a big manufacturer has a chip in it. It's not a big cost. It costs like... It's, it's nominal compared to the nominal, actual forget cart. It. We don't use the chip because we didn't buy the weeder. So you about Star Trek, they have a little technical box that you read. Mr. Spock and Dr. McCoy would read things. We, the reader costs a couple thousand dollars. Was it a mistake, do you think, on your part not to get the reader? Not at this point, because we're not, because each of the cart has a serial number. And here, oh, here's one little trick that I, I was very happy that we did. So they said, listen, we're gonna have serial numbers in the carts. Do you want them? And we said, absolutely. So the serial numbers we put down there was 2017, 2017, and then a number, a seven digit code after that. And so when they got done with the things, they gave us a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet with the serial number for each household. So we would know what your number is, your number is. So if you call me up and say, hey, my cart got stolen, then I would be able to track it back. If I find it two weeks later, say, hey, ma'am, we found your cart. Uh, and so we just found 16 carts that were stolen from various households and brought behind a supermarket. And we realized it's probably can scavengers who were basically using the cart to grab all their cans and bottles, rolling them down behind the supermarket, grab the cans and bottles, and just left the carts there. Are our numbers, whether there's a cross-reference that was implemented when they distribute them, it's right. yet to be seen. The, but. That, that, to my mind, is very helpful. And, but again, if, nobody, if I wasn't tracking it, nobody would be tracking it. So here's a problem that all municipalities, I think, faced in Connecticut. The, pro, the law was passed in 87, programs geared up in 89 and 90, they almost all hired a recycling coordinator or shared a recycling coordinator like Scare did or basically said, okay, guess what? You're wearing the recycling hat too and gave that to you. They focused on the program, pushed it for fly, and then there were budget cuts and then people retired and then recycling wasn't as important anymore. City of New Haven had three recycling staff, then two, then one, then a half, and now basically zero. So there's no education in the city of New Haven for recycling. I mean, I live there, so it's interesting working for Waterbury and watching what happens or doesn't happen in New Haven. Uh, New Haven doesn't even have labels on its recycling carts. So they gave labels to us citizens, and we've actually been going around putting them out there as a citizen's brigade to help the program, which I'm fine to do, but it's just they haven't been pushing those issues. So getting these labeled with the serial number and tracking them, having a staff person track them is important, I think, whether or not you have that, that gizmo. I can still just write the number down. And, and track it with an Excel spreadsheet. Would Waterbury be moving in the direction that it is currently without the grant you alluded to at the top of your talk? That's a really good question. That grant was on the table before I walked in the door or even for an interview. So I'm not sure. Uh, I think this in part happened uh, because the head of public works was at a meeting with the closed loop fund and a bunch of other municipalities. And the municipalities were asked, what could we do to help you fix up recycling? And somebody said, hey, uh, we want to buy new park bins. And closed loop said, no, you know, that's not going to help. Or we want to do this. And they said, no. And then Waterbury said, listen, uh, we're really not doing much recycling. We only have a few of these bins. We really like to get up to the 20th, 21st century standards and get carts. And he said, you, we can help. And so I, I think the mayor wanted to go ahead. They could have done a bond. Um, they did float bonds for the trucks that they couldn't buy with the closed loop zero interest loan. And actually, I think they may have done bonds for everything anyway, because they had to have a uniform income and uh, payment plan for closed loop. Um, so they might have eventually done it anyway without closed loop's help. But the fact that we were able to get a zero interest loan was a nice thing uh, for us to be able to do. And our payment, we have a regular payment. We pay them back over a number of years. 
the payment plan is not going to be working as sweetly as we expected because when we were getting four twenty-five a ton and paying sixty-three bucks a ton, basically every time we recycled, benefited Waterbury by about seventy dollars. Now recycling still benefits us, but only by about twenty-five dollars a ton. That's a lot slower payback period. We still have to pay closed loop back the same plan. We couldn't just say this month it's going to be this month and this month it's going to be different. We couldn't do that. It had to be uniform. So it just means water braid doesn't experience the benefits as quickly along the way. And, and uh, if you could do this briefly, uh, why did Yale and or Waterbury not tackle pay-as-you throw? Well, what, we, we looked briefly at pay-as-you throw in at Yale, but it's very challenging. So say you had a building with a hundred different people in, in it. And that building is going to have secretaries, it's going to have custodians, it's going to have professors, it's going to have students, like a physics building or something. And the more trash they throw away, the more money they have to pay. Who of the people I mentioned to you actually cares how much that building has to pay for trash? None of them. The only person who probably cares is the physics department business manager. The custodian doesn't care how many trash bags he puts out. The professor doesn't care, the students don't care, the research assistants don't care. So pay-as-you-throw only really works if I'm the one footing the bill and I'm the one putting out the trash. So if it's your house, you're going to care how much money you have to spend. But if it's the physics department, eh, who cares? It's Yale money, it's not my money. So that's... And, and, that's, Waterbury. and Waterbury, so Waterbury, at this point, we're not looking at pay-as-you-throw. They did a study to show us what some of the benefits would be for pay-as-you-throw. The, the perspective really was we don't want to change too many things at one time. We want to make sure that as we're launching the recycling program here, it's greeted with warm hearts and open minds and welcoming spirit. Whereas if we said, okay, we're going to give you a new recycling cart and we're going to make you pay for your trash, that would be first a little confusing because two things are being changed. And the sweetness of a recycling program could be tarnished by some people saying, wait, wait, you're going to make me pay for my trash now? I am a fan, personally, of pay-as-you-throw. But I certainly understand that, that uh, Waterbury looked at this and said, this is too many changes at this point. Let's make sure the recycling program goes as far as it can go to reduce our trash. And after that, if we still need to reduce more, then we can talk about pay-as-you-throw. And that we may look at it five or ten years from now. I, I'm not sure. No. I have a question on that. Um, what, what about low-income families? I mean, what? how is that beneficial to them when they're low-income? Yep. I mean, pay-as-you-throw? Yeah, pay-as-you-throw. Well, just as every household has a basic rate, and I'm not sure pay-as-you-throw has been done in certain places the way it's been done, say, for water. In some areas, arid parts of the country where they actually have water, have a differential rate, that every household gets a big block of water with a very low rate. So that everybody has enough water for their for their drinking and eating and showering and bathing and all the things you need. But if you go below beyond that basic rate, it becomes more expensive per gallon. To basically say you get all the things you need, but if you start being wasteful, it's going to cost you a lot more. Like if you have a swimming pool, it, that's going to cost you. So there could be ways that you could run pay as you throw to say we're going to make sure everybody gets to put out a bag of trash or two bags of trash. And one of the ways that has been done in other communities is not with pay-as-you-throw as, as bag-based, but pay-as-you-throw as, as cart-based. For instance, you could have a trash cart and a recycling cart, and you get to put out one cart of trash a week. If you put out any more than that one cart of trash, then you've got to pay for it. And so that means if I keep all my trash within one cart, I'm good. You know, If I start putting up three or four stuff, the city wouldn't pick up anything in addition to that, you'd have to have those special bags. So that's a hybrid system to make sure everybody has a certain level of trash collection without having it be a burden, depending on family size. So that's one way I think that people have been doing it. So out of curiosity, not so yeah. much the pay-as-you-throw program, but um, I'm, I'm not sure which town is in Connecticut. They only pick up garbage if garbage is in a bag. Uh -huh. It's in your car, sure. but it's in a bag. And when they dump it, you can kind of see right. just like your program. Yeah. Do you have any feelings on that, or do you know anything about that? I, I have to admit, I have pros and cons. I, I, I'm going to admit this. I mean, he's got me on camera here, so I'm going to admit it. Is I've gotten in trouble with my local trash guy in, in New Haven when sometimes I would put individual items into my trash cart, 
and I would happen to be coming back from a run or something like that, and he would be bringing it over, and about to tip it, and he would see loose stuff, and he'd go, ah! And he would, like, put it back, and he'd say, no, it's got to be in a bag. Um, and there's good reasons for it to be in a bag, so that it doesn't go higgledy-piggledy all over the street. I mean, when they tip it, it's a violent action, and if it's a lot of loose stuff, um, especially shredded paper, you can have this big flurry of stuff all over the street, and it's a mess, and it's not good for the driver. It's not good for your street. Um, it saves a plastic bag. I, I mean, in general, I think plastic bags for trash are probably a good idea. Uh, depending, our, My trash is probably a little less gooky because I'm a big home composter, and all my wet, nasty stuff goes to my compost pile, and so my trash is relatively dry. But the standard practice of encouraging residents to have a trash bag for all this stuff is probably is a good one at this point. The um, idea for us would be it has to be in a bag, if not a lot of those things actually they get disposed of for free at our transfer station, like electronics or oil or rain, right. you know. Um, but we have to get our residents to the transfer station, which is a, a challenge, um, knowing where it is, right. first of all. So it, it, it's just a, an idea that I had seen. Well, what are the, this is certainly not an overall solution to everything, but um, a lot of my education, I, I try to go both ends of the spectrum. One is I do environmental magic shows and presentations like this sort of thing. I go out to every neighborhood group I can. I go to events. I do magic shows for kids at schools. I go and talk to the grown-ups at residents. Estoy aprendiendo español. I'm learning a little Spanish so I can talk to other people about these issues. And I hand out flyers. And I've got some flyers here with a lot of information. I even go to the health department, which is in my building. And when they're waiting to go and see some of the health workers, I go and do magic tricks for them. And then I talk to them about recycling. And this is a one-pager that is information on trash, recycling, electronics, leaves, scrap metal, paint. One sheet, uh, and I figured if there's only one piece of paper I was going to give to every resident, this would be it. Uh, and it's English and it's Spanish. Uh, and so I think, great, and hopefully if they have a question, now they know there's something they can do. So personal contact I find very, very important. On the other side of the spectrum, I'm shameless about Facebook. Um, and Facebook has been very useful to me in reaching Waterbury residents, and the best testimony to that was on the day we launched the program. And finally, in the beginning of October 2017, we got the word, okay, we're gonna start it, I think, on October 19th. We're all set, I check with my boss, I check with everybody, okay, we're good, good. So I put out on Facebook, on the Waterbury Recycling Facebook page, October 19th, we'll start delivering the carts, it'll take a month. That post was shared through so many people throughout Waterbury that got 13,000 views. That's more than 10% of the city's population saw that one Facebook post, and it cost zero. It cost me, except for my time. But I build up, and I, I am, again, shameless in trying to reach out to everybody I can in Waterbury to get them to like my Facebook page. And so I put up useful information. Hey, snow day, we're not collecting today. You know, or bulk trash pickup. Make sure you call for the bulk trash pickup. Here's it. Or leaf day or whatever it happens to be. I put it on Facebook and it's always upbeat. And I don't harp on environmental bad things. But these people are bad. Blah, 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 blah. I say, hey, please don't put your styrofoam in. Don't put your plastic bags in. And what happens is people share that. I mean, I don't know if you guys use Facebook a lot. But if in my response to it, like, no plastic bags, please, I pipe John Jones, who's my friend, in the reply, ping, John Jones gets pinged. So when John Jones opens up their Facebook, they say, what's this? I got pinged. Then they look at the Facebook post, and now they've been pinged, so now they know about the no plastic bags. So it's like a virus, but a good way. Um, and I find Facebook to be a very helpful tool for reaching citizens. Um, so it's, it's a good thing to do um, on top of a lot of person-to-person -person connection. So can we, uh, I was just saying, is it okay for you to take a few questions? Please, whatever you want. I mean, I, 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 I do your questions are about 10, sure. 10 minutes. Okay. So, so you get a lot of talk ahead. about recycling. Yeah. And you hear piecemeal. And then everybody does everything, but nobody understands the entire picture. Where does all this recycling eventually end up? Sure. Depends on the different materials. Um, again, about third of the United States trash or so recyclables was going to China, now a lot of it's not going. And a lot of it, let me say what is not going, and I'm very sad about this. Connecticut in the last 20 years has lost two paperboard manufacturers that make, let's say, a cereal board, uh, Colonial, is it Colonial? Uh, and then in, in Simpkins in New Haven, where I live, and then also Anchor Glass, which is a glass manufacturing facility. Those were local jobs. 
And as China began buying more and more stuff, it was probably harder for these companies to sort of upgrade and compete, so they closed. And then China eventually says, hey, we can't do this anymore, or we don't want your stuff anymore. Now we don't have the capacity in Connecticut to recycle as much material as we used to. This makes me sad. Okay. Yeah. So what's, so, what's the so, point of recycling? Yeah. If it's got no place to go. It does have places. Well, where's it going? Yeah, like we said, it goes to certain places. A lot of it goes to Canada. Some of it's going. Some of it's still going to China. Some of it's going to Southeast Asia. Cardboard still has a high market value. Paper, depending on the kind of paper, has a mixed market value. Absolutely, steel tin cans, aluminum, number one and number two plastics. These are the predominant bits that generate income. And those are the stuff that the recycling centers that we send our materials to love because they are making money selling. It's harder for them right now, but they're still making money selling that stuff. So I want to get that button. Yeah. So, so um, have you looked at neighborhood recycling, especially where you have the cul-de-sacs and if you, so that you would have a group of people all bringing their recyclables to a central point in a neighborhood? And if you have, how many categories would there be? I think people played with that back in the 1990s, saying a local drop-off. In New Haven, we had you know, maybe five or ten different drop-off places around the city of New Haven where you could bring your stuff. And basically, once curbside recycling started, they stopped doing neighborhood drop-offs. I don't know if anybody who's doing drop-offs at this point. Uh, maybe other parts of the country may have that. I don't know. If, if, if you, how many categories would there be if, if did something like that. How oh, many? it depends. I, I think some places are saying because glass is a problem right now, they might have a separate fiber stream, which would be paper and cardboard, and then you could have glass, metal, plastic, and, and they might even say no glass. Uh, in the Fairfield County area, they're actually going to experiment with stopping recycling glass because glass is such a problem right now. They're going to say, stop it, no glass, and tell people no more glass. But they may be even doing some drop-off locations too. So I want to get to that, Dennis. Also. Okay, um, man, you. I got so many questions here. <laughs> and you really. First of all, yeah. plastic. Yeah. You're saying no plastic in the recycle bin. No, no plastic bags. Plastic bags. Plastic bags. Plastic bags. Yeah. Okay, that I've been doing wrong. Sure. Um, as far as the the bins go, with the covers, that makes sense. A lot of people don't do that. They put those little bins out, and they can fill with water. What I did was I got a uh, trash can, and somebody that worked for the city at the time brought me home a sticker that said recycle, which I stuck on that right. can with holes on the side so it won't fill with water. Uh -huh. That works for me, I guess. Um, you said something about the pickup, about if something's on Monday and Tuesday and something can't happen, so you move it to Tuesday and Wednesday? That's just our schedule in Waterbury. Yeah, but I mean, what was that for? Oh, so we do curbside pickup in different neighborhoods, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Wednesday is the swing day. Some weeks it's oh, for so leaves. it's not garbage. No, some, yeah, some weeks it's for leaves, some weeks it's for junk. But the good point is if you had a Monday holiday, like Veterans Day or Memorial Day, all you do is take Monday, Tuesday, and just push them back. And that okay. week, there wouldn't be any leaf collection. There wouldn't be any junk collection. You're just pushing back the Monday, Tuesday. And, and that, that seems to work fairly well for water. Does, that, does that, that pertain to... Generally, no. And if there's a Friday holiday, then they have to do side of Saturday. But was that pertaining to your regular garbage and recycle pickup? Yeah. Moving the days? Yeah. Okay. Now, if you had... Um, and I know you're dealing with the union like we are here. If you had the week change to where they would be picking up Tuesday to Saturday to where they would get one uh, holiday on Monday off automatically, but when they worked Saturday, it wouldn't be time and a half. That, I don't know. I mean, that, that's, uh, that I think would be a union like discussion. A union. That's a negotiation. Okay, now one more, one more thing. One more thing. I know union people are going to hate me. One more thing. You were just talking about hypodermic needles. Yeah. Um, now, you have a lot of diabetics out there that use insulin. So they get the little needles that go on the end of their pens. And I myself am diabetic, and when I'm done with it, I put it all back together so there's no points. It's all like Great. a little thing, and I throw it in a garbage can. Yeah. Now, I heard you say something about putting hypodermics in a, a plastic leach bottle. Is there some other way to do it other than the way I'm doing it? Uh, that, yours sounds like it's a protected point. It because is. Because it's got a cap on it, but which still, is you know, wonderful. I, um, I had it. 
The city of Waterbury's police department, actually, oh, that's the yeah, uh, is, is, is promoting uh, disposal of medicines, not in the trash. Yeah. But our standard practice in the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, DEEP, does have a PDF that you can print out about needle disposal. And their basic idea is put it into a rigid container and put that rigid container in the trash. Um, just as a, an extra level. What do you mean by rigid? Like, like a uh, bleach bottle, you know, like a Tide bottle or something like that, because it's a very, that's number two plastic. It's pretty gosh darn strong. And so if I'm putting my needles in there, it, it, it's not going to likely have anybody get injured or stuck. So we're running a little short on sure. time, but I'm wondering if maybe you would indulge us in do one more magic trick. Uh, gosh, magic tricks. Well, I'm not sure if I can do a magic trick, but maybe you guys can do a magic trick. But see, see, one of the things I try to talk to people about, and it goes back to your question, sir. You had a really, his question is like, so why should we bother recycling if it's not of value? And uh, I think one of the things I try to tell people in Waterbury is that, unfortunately, this is often considered trash. This bottle. Now, if it had a label on it, it wasn't crunched up, it would be worth what? Five cents. And somebody would bring it back to the store because they could get five cents for it. But I'm trying to tell people that this bottle, this bottle isn't garbage. This bottle is polyethylene terephthalic plastic. It's very valuable. It can be made into carpet, like the carpet that we're on. It can be made into fleece. People will buy it for fleece. It can be made into bottles because it isn't garbage. Every can, every bottle, every piece of paper or cardboard box, the reason we want to recycle it is because it is not trash. But it does need you to put it in the right bin and give it a second chance. Big <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thanks to CJ for coming all the way from Waterbury and... Uh, I have a little present for you. Uh, Garbage? <laughs> well, it depends. <laughs> uh, I have no authority to do, to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I'm going to dub you an honorary member of our committee for... Well, you, you're very kind. Five more minutes. We have a hat from New London. Oh, excellent. For you. Thank you, so Don't mess up your head. No, no, no. The, oh, just, oh, yes. Listen, yeah, those are our colors, too. This, this is not going to mess up a ha hair for me, because with me, unfortunately, every day is a bad hair day. So this, this actually makes it a lot better. So thank you. Um, and I, I've got, for anybody who wants it, here's an example of the, the sheet that we hand out. I've got some samples of our, our literature. Just to see if it's at all helpful to you guys. Uh, the magnet, um, some of our... Yeah, yeah, I had a magnet. And, and here's some of the literature that we, we sent home with people. Um, and then one thing also, and I think you were talking about, you know, the city, I mean, the, the state of Connecticut has some really good right. information about what can and what can't be recycled. And you don't have to pay a graphic designer to design. It's already designed, you know. So here, here's some stuff that this, um, I think that he was passing out. Um, Another thing that we need to do is let we send out some to let them know what we can and can't. So uh, if, if you are in Skira, in Winston Averill is in your, you're in Winston Averill's jurisdiction, he does do a little bit recycling magic. Okay. Uh, and so maybe you can invite him to come to events because I found recycling magic is a nice way to talk to people about recycling. If I went around and said, you better recycle, you better recycle, you better recycle, I just ticked you off. We're all Americans in this room. We don't like to be told what to do. We just do not like to be told what to do. But instead, I want to say, I want to show you something really cool that you can do sure. that will save money and will help the planet at the same time. Then people are more interested. And so as a part of the, the information I hand out to school kids when I go to them, I also have a certificate on the back. So this side is mostly for the kid. This side is mostly for the, the adult. But this is like, this certifies that little Jimmy has uh, completed initial training in the magic of recycling. And they can put it in their fridge. But the goal is to try to have this kid think positively about their role in recycling. Uh, to think about what they can do and that they are powerful. Kids love to be powerful. Uh, and they love the idea that they can change old into new when recycling. So these certificates are a fun way to, to help uh, kids as well. Um, think about their role. Great. 
the 1960s, an anti-war movement emerged that has been effective